Sony and Paul Feig's Ghostbusters reboot will soon be released, and both the marketing and spin machine is kicking into high gear. In this video, we will cover how Sony and the media outlets supportive of the movie have chosen to address the alleged misogynist attacks, how it became what some call a political act to see a movie, and how Sony is trying to market the movie to a male audience. Beyond the numerous dislikes and other comments on the trailers on YouTube, whether they are posted on Sony's official YouTube channel or not, many fans have been quite outspoken and articulate about why they have issues with both trailers that have been released, as well as the entire approach to the movie. Many of the reasons overlap. While some differ, one common recurring theme seems to be that it is not about the ladies. This point is frequently brought up by the movie's male detractors, and the sheer number of subtractors who happen to be female would seem to support this as well. As early as March 12th, prolific YouTuber Comic Book Girl 19, who has close to a half a million subscribers, shared her thoughts on the trailers and why she disliked them. She rejected the notion of the movie being progressive, as a mixed team of men and women working together, in her view, would have been far more progressive, which was incidentally what original Ghostbusters director Ivan Reitman wanted for his now defunct Ghostbusters 3. Her issue with the all women team was that it made it look like, quote unquote, women sucks. She rounded out the video suggesting that audiences maybe should not see the movie in order to send Hollywood the message that remaking movies had gone too far, and that if you support this movie, the inevitable Back to the Future remake will be your fault. Despite actively encouraging the audience not to see the movie, there was no outrage. No media attacked Comic Book Girl 19 for voicing a well-reasoned and articulated opinion, despite her doubling down on this opinion in later videos as well. On May 16th, James Rolfe, most known for his angry video game nerd character, posted a video where he appeared as himself, James Rolfe, not the nerd, and gave calm and reasoned arguments as to why he had no interest in this movie, and that he would not go see and review a movie that he had no interest in. He didn't express any hatred towards it, nor did he encourage any kind of boycott. He merely stated he would not be reviewing a movie he had already seen enough of to decide was not for him. Keep in mind, James Rolfe is not a professional critic working for an established media outlet, where reviewing movies one might not be interested in is part of his job description. He is a YouTuber on his own time, who is free to review or not to review whatever he sees fit. He has no formal obligation to review any movie. This did not protect him from the backlash that would ensue. For this perceived audacity of him refusing to review the movie, James Rolfe made headlines. While some outlets acknowledged that he might have some points, they still criticized him, and many others more or less rejected everything he actually said and supplanted their own narrative. For instance, IndieWire stated that, It doesn't take a giant leap of logic and faith to presume that his ideological problem with the film stems from the fact that it stars four women in a previously male-dominated franchise, and that, the gendered outcry around the film has dominated social media and YouTube comments for months now. Several outlets painted a picture of Rolf as a parent's basement dwelling misogynistic sexist man-child, making him the face of the alleged haters of the movie. Attacks got even more personal on Twitter, where some even brought in his family. Freelance film critic Eric D. Snyder stated that he kept fixating on Rolf's wedding ring, in disbelief that someone quote-unquote actually married this man-baby, while Daniel Carson of The Slate followed up by describing Rolf's wife as quote-unquote probably a gold digger who just married him for his Star Trek V gumball. Rejecting all criticism directed at the movie as misogyny would appear to have been an emerging strategy of choice in dealing with criticism directed at the film. As early as when the first trailer dropped on Sony's YouTube channel, many reported observing that Sony deleted all well-articulated criticism as well as critical comments by women, yet they left all the actual sexist comments intact, presumably in order to better maintain the illusion that any outcry over the movie was exclusively due to the female cast, and that anyone hating on it were misogynist men. This might be one reason why female detractors, who more or less encourage audiences not to see the movie, are left alone, while a prolific male YouTuber saying he won't see the movie was made the pallbearer for misogyny, this despite never having said anything that remotely could be construed as sexist. Also, the filmmakers themselves have made numerous public statements which fall right in line with this chosen narrative. 
Director Paul Feig has been particularly vocal about his feelings toward those critical of his movie. On May 2nd, the New York Daily News published Feig's comment that Geek culture is home to some of the biggest assholes I've ever met in my life. His comments did not cause much soul-searching and regret in the fan community. On the contrary, fans seemed to take issue with the director calling them assholes, which, if anything, increased the level of vitriol directed at the movie a few notches. It took one full week before Feig modified the comments that were spreading like wildfire. On May 9th, Feig clarified that while the comments were published only the week before, he had made them in 2015, shortly after the new Ghostbusters were announced, before the trailer outcry ever hit. Furthermore, he claimed his asshole comments were meant to be directed at the online trolls, none of which he had ever met in person, and not at fandom at large. This, however, was not the end of shaming fans. Melissa McCarthy also chimed in. She told The Guardian that she imagined the males critical of the movie to have no spouse and no friends, just sitting in front of the computer and spewing hate into the fake world of the internet. She also told her opinion of the male Ghostbusters detractors to Jimmy Kimmel, joking that, quote, What they don't say when they're typing is that one minute after they type, their mom is like, Get upstairs and take out the garbage. You're 45 years old. Feig and the cast would all continue the detractors are misogynist man-childs living in their parents' basements narrative in other interviews as well. On the Graham Norton show, they even sang an a cappella version of the Ghostbusters theme song, since they were the destroyers of men's childhoods. That some women's childhoods might be destroyed too did not seem to phase them. On June 1st, director Paul Feig's friend and former co-director Judd Apatow had a new name in store for the movie's detractors, labeling them Trump supporters. He told Uproxx that, I would assume there's a very large crossover of people who are doubtful Ghostbusters will be great and people who are excited about Donald Trump's candidacy. However, this opinion is probably Apatow's own and not representative of Sony's official stance on the matter, as studios generally do not want a movie associated with a political candidate, especially not in an election year. On May 25th, the week before Apatow labeled the Ghostbusters detractors as Trump supporters, the new Ghostbusters actresses were guests on Ellen. Another guest on that same show was Hillary Clinton. Ellen DeGeneres promoted the show on Twitter by saying, The entire cast of Ghostbusters is here next week, and now Hillary Clinton is coming too. Get your woman cards ready. This contributed to further politicizing the movie, making seeing it a political act according to some and a duty according to others. The Ghostbusters and Hillary Clinton segments were taped separately. The only Ghostbuster to actually appear on screen with Hillary Clinton was Kate McKinnon. According to the New York Times, the identification with a hip, somewhat younger group of actresses was a chance for Hillary to score points with younger female voters. However, according to Sony sources the New York Times spoke to, Sony were less than ecstatic about the association between their movie and a political candidate. Sony had booked the Ellen appearance two months earlier, and they were reportedly very happy about the promotional opportunity at the time. Since then, however, the movie had come under fire from what they deemed to be orchestrated misogynistic attacks. They now had to consider themselves to be in a position where they had to increase the movie's appeal to younger male audiences. The Clinton appearance was booked only a couple of weeks before the show was to air. By then, Sony worried that the association between the Ghostbusters and Hillary Clinton might get in the way of appealing to a younger male demographic. Since the first batch of promo pictures apparently did not go down well with male audiences, Sony responded by releasing a set of darker, moodier posters reminiscent of the noir advertisements for the graphic novel-based movie Sin City, hoping that would increase the appeal. They would later also promote the movie to male audiences without showcasing the actresses at all. Sony produced two TV spots in time for the NBA Finals. The first featured NBA All-Star Carmelo Anthony, rookie sensation Kristaps Porzingis, director Spike Lee and New York Knicks Hall of Famer Walt Clyde Frazier, dressed up in Ghostbusters regalia to fight Slimer on the floor of Madison Square Garden. The second ad featured Kobe Bryant flying a Ghostbusters-themed helicopter over the Staples Center. And this is not all. You might have also noticed commercials for insurance and other products featuring the Ghostbusters brand, music, and men in Ghostbusters regalia, with no reference to the women. These commercials all serve the double purpose of selling the product advertised as well as the movie to the male audience. Let us know what you think and if you're more excited about seeing the movie in the comments section below.
If you like this video, please hit that subscribe button. Join us for spin-free news and analysis of the happenings and corporate politics behind the scenes of your favorite genre movies, as well as explorations of your favorite characters and their backgrounds and context here at Midnight's Edge.